Okay, so the, uh, if you didn't catch the context of Romans 14 is this topic of doubtful disputations. Doubtful disputations. So the title of my sermon this morning is Commandments versus Convictions. So I want to talk about the difference between a commandment and a conviction um, so that you know the difference and also you don't mistake one for the other because there is a danger of not differentiating what a commandment is to what a conviction is and there are three dangers right if you do not differentiate between these two one is we can look at matthew 15. matthew 15 is we see these traditions from the pharisees and whatnot that are actually counteracting what god has commanded matthew 15 we just read from verse 8 it says here, This people draweth nigh unto me with their mouth, and honoureth me with their lips, but their heart is far from me. But in vain they do worship me. Look at this. Teaching for doctrines the commandments of men. So sometimes when we don't differentiate between, hey, what is actually commanded of God, and what is a conviction or a preference that I base off those commandments, if we start instead teaching our convictions as commandments, we, fall into, we can fall into the trap of teaching for doctrines the commandments of men, things that we just prefer or we are convicted about personally, but we teach that as if people do not follow our convictions, they are breaking God's commandments. That is a one danger because that is not the case if you don't differentiate between um, convictions and commandments is you can teach for doctrines the commandments of men. What's a second danger if you don't differentiate between commandments and convictions? Well, another one is, is you can have the wrong emphasis in the wrong areas. Right? Look at Matthew 23. Woe unto you, scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites, for ye pay tithe of mint and anise and cumin, and have omitted the weightier matters of the law, judgment, mercy and faith these ought ye to have done and not to leave the other undone so what is jesus saying here uh, and then we read on in matthew 24 you blind guides which strain at a gnat and swallow a camel so notice there is there was nothing necessarily wrong with tithing on mint anise and cumin right so they were doing right in terms of tithing on even these small things. But what you have to realize is there are weightier matters of the law. There are things that are, are more important than others, where the emphasis should be and the emphasis should not be. So here there are two laws where one is actually more important than the other, right? Because Jesus says you've omit omitted, which means you haven't done, the weightier matters of the law. So you can't just have, you know, people have this idea that all sin is the same, all laws are the same. This is not the case. Now, will the, if you break the least of the commandments, will that still end you up in hell if you don't believe on the Lord Jesus Christ? Yes, but that does not mean all sin is equal. You know, when people say, oh, you know, somebody who steals a paperclip is the same as like the serial rapist. These people are deluded, they're crazy. And it's the same that not all things in the law are the same as well, right? There are things that are more of value in the law than other things. And we can see here that how you give to, how you work out how much you give to God, right, is less than having justice, you know, judgment, mercy, and faith. And he's saying, hey, if you're going to leave something undone, which you should, I mean, obviously you should, you should try and do it all. He's saying you shouldn't do this and leave this undone you should do this rather and leave this undone rather if you're going to leave something undone but my point here is there are weightier things in the law and just like with commandments and convictions if you do not differentiate the, between the two you may have so much emphasis on convictions and trying to get people to live the way you live and do the things that you do how you interpret the bible that you stop actually teaching the bible Right? And I stop actually teaching hey, what the Bible actually says about these and giving people a solid foundation. Because sometimes people, they just teach their convictions and that's all they teach. They don't teach how they come to those convictions. 
right? Teaching the Bible, and then people actually sometimes have an unstable Christianity because they don't know how to figure out for themselves the difference between the two, and they just end up following and living how people teach them to live, how people tell them how to dress, how people tell them how to talk, and then they end up actually having their faith in a person who's teaching them all these things rather than having their faith in the Word of God and knowing how to use God's Word to guide them in their life and make these decisions and see how people have made their decisions based on the Scriptures. So you don't want to have the, wrong, the emphasis in the wrong place. That's why we can see a gnat obviously is a small creature and a camel is a large creature. And Jesus is referring to laws as, hey, there are some gnats in the law. And there are some camels in the law. So we don't want to think all the law is in that, all the law is just camels. There is a difference between the, the weightier matters and the, and the lesser matters. Um, and the last one, the last danger of not differentiating between a commandment and a conviction is that you can judge somebody else's liberty by your own conscience. Right? And this is what happens in Christian circles when they don't differentiate between commandments and convictions. We end up condemning one another for, for our own personal convictions rather than writing people off for, for actually committing sin. Now there are certain sins that we ought to judge. So you, when we go through Romans 14, this is something important to note that when it talks about judging, it's not just talking about we don't judge at all. I mean, the context of Romans 14 is these doubtful disputations. The problem is, is that we condemn one another, we write each other off, we, we judge one another on things of conviction. We need to realize that there is liberty amongst Christianity to exercise our faith, exercise our convictions based on the clear commands. And we need to understand this. So whilst we may have different opinions on what our convictions are, we need to allow for that liberty there and understand people can have a difference of convictions. So we don't want to judge somebody else by our own convictions. Rather, we may try and convince them of our convictions, but we don't condemn them for them, for them just because they have a difference of conviction. 1 Corinthians 10, and we'll go to this passage in more depth a bit later, but he says here, Conscience, I say, not thine own, but of the other, for why is my liberty judged of another man's conscience? So Paul actually in this passage has it the other way, whereas I'm saying there's a danger that we judge somebody else's liberty by our conscience, but I'm getting the principle here from Paul saying, hey, why should I be judged? Because somebody else's conscience has that conviction. That's what he's saying here. Why is my liberty judged or condemned of another man's conscience? Okay, so let's get into like the meat of the sermon. First of all, what is a commandment? I know these are pretty clear cut, but I just thought I'd do some basics. What is a commandment? Well, a commandment is a clear statement in the Bible. A clear command in the Bible. Look at Luke 18. Luke 18, verse 20. Jesus says here, Thou knowest the commandments. Do not commit adultery. Do not kill. Do not steal. Do not bear false witness, honor thy father and thy mother. So Jesus is mentioning in this passage a few of the Ten Commandments. Now the Ten Commandments are not the only commandments there are. Right? There are a lot of other commandments in the Bible that are there. The Ten are significant because they sort of form the foundation of the rest of the commandments that are given to the nation of Israel. And they are particularly significant because those were the ones that were spoken by God in the Mount. So that's why they had a key significance. They were the first Ten Commandments given, and they were the ones spoken from the mount. And after those first ten were given, the people were like, they didn't, remember we read in Hebrews 12, like people didn't, didn't want to hear from God anymore. They were scared. They said, hey, Moses, you just get the rest of the commandments, because if God keeps talking to us, they were scared they were going to die. Because not all the Ten Commandments are still kept, right? Because the Sabbath is in those Ten Commandments. But those, that does not apply to the New Testament today. So you have to understand that the Ten Commandments are not just these timeless commandments. They're significant for another reason. But what is a commandment? A commandment is a clear command from God. So you don't commit adultery. Committing adultery is a sin. You don't kill. You don't, and we know this is murder, right? Because you, there's obviously capital punishment. Do not steal, do not bear false witness, honour thy father and thy mother. So this is what a commandment is. A commandment is a clear statement in the Bible. Now, to commit sin is the opposite of keeping a commandment. So to keep a commandment is to do one of these. To sin is to break one of these. 1 John 3, whosoever committeth sin 
transgresseth also the law, for sin is the transgression of the law. So this is pretty basic stuff. But you have to understand that a command, keeping a commandment and doing a sin are the two, two sides of the same coin. Right? When you break a commandment, you do a sin. When you don't sin, you must keep a commandment to not sin. Right? These are the, the same things. So if you think about what a commandment is, if it's a, let's say bear, bearing false witness, right? This is probably the easiest one. Uh, to, or we can all use an example for all of them. But if you bear false witness, you sin. If you refrain from bearing false witness, you are keeping the commandment. Right? So this is why when people say you need to turn from sin to be saved, this is why we say, we're saying this is work salvation. Because if you need to keep if you need to stop doing a sin in order to be saved or refrain from sinning, that is the same thing as keeping a commandment. Because when you break the commandment, you are sinning. When you refrain from sinning, you are keeping a commandment. These are just two sides of the same coin. Now, what is a conviction? Right? So that's what a command is. A commandment is a clear command in the Bible. You can point to the Bible and you can say, because you can say, it's wrong to commit adultery. Why? Because there is a clear statement in the Bible that you do not commit adultery. It's a command. So when I say to you, hey, it's wrong for you to commit adultery, that is not a conviction of mine. Right? That is a commandment. That is something that applies to everybody because it's not just my own conviction. Now, what is the difference with a conviction? A conviction is something... It's, it's, a conviction is your own personal thoughts about how to apply a commandment. Now, in Romans 14, you have what is called doubtful disputations. So it's something that your own conscience, when, when you have a conviction, your own conscience is what's telling you that it's wrong, but not the Word of God itself. Right? So let's have a look at John 8. Right? In John 8, it says here, And they which heard it, being convicted by their own conscience, went out one by one, beginning at the eldest, even unto the last, and Jesus was left alone, and the woman standing in the midst. So you can see here that your convictions come from your conscience. right? So your, what is your conscience? That's what we're going to talk about next. right? So what is your convictions? Your convictions is how your conscience feels about God's law. right? So you have God's law, and then you have your conscience bearing witness about how to apply that law in different areas and that's where we get our convictions from so it's when so what is a conviction it's when you believe something to be right or wrong based on the conscience now it is different to a preference right because because you have a commandment which is a clear statement you have a conviction is what you believe to be right and wrong even though it's not a clear command stated in the Bible based on your conscience. And then you have preferences. Preferences is when you prefer to do something, but you don't think it's wrong not to do that. Right? So you may go, you know, I prefer to you know, wear certain colours, but I don't think it's a sin not to wear those colours. But when you have a conviction, you're saying, this is the, I believe this is the right thing to do, and if I don't do it, I'm not doing what's right. Do you see the difference? And a command is, it doesn't matter what you think, right? You can have a conviction the other way from a commandment. You may be convicted that it's right to commit adultery. You may have a preference to commit well, Your preferences and your convictions no longer matter when it's a command because you're commanded to do it anyway. When it comes to your convictions, it's based on your conscience, what you believe is right and wrong. Your preferences is what you prefer to do, but it's not right or wrong to do whether you do it or not. So it's very important to know the difference between these. So conviction is not a preference, right? Because you can have preferences. It's not a matter of right and wrong. A conviction is what you believe to be right or wrong. Commandment is, is right or wrong, whether you believe it to be right or wrong or not. Now, what is your conscience? Right? So your, what, are your, what is your conscience? We read in Romans 2 here, For when the Gentiles, which have not the law, do by nature the things contained in the law, these having not the law are a law unto themselves, which show the work of the law written in their hearts. Look at this. Their conscience also bearing witness. So your conscience is something that God has given you to bear witness whether or not 
you're, what you're doing is right or wrong, which is according to the law. So it's an interesting thing that we have this innate sense, which is the conscience, where we know something is innately right or wrong. This is why it's saying here, the Gentiles, people who were not taught the laws of God, still do naturally things contained in the law because the law of God is in their hearts. So they know innately lying is wrong, stealing is wrong, you know, murder is wrong. And even though they don't follow the laws given to the nation of Israel, they themselves, the Gentile nation, set up laws like that. They will have laws that prohibit, prohibit stealing. And we see that, you know, even in Australia, you know, there's still laws that do this, even though it's a secular nation. So this is what Romans 2 is talking about, that there is this innate law written in people's hearts and we are given a conscience which bears witness to this law written in our hearts and how does it come out look at this says it says here and their thoughts the meanwhile accusing or excusing one another so it's like your conscience is in your thoughts of what based on your inherent knowledge of god's law what you think is right and wrong that's what your conscience is that's why it says their thoughts the meanwhile accusing right telling you you're wrong or else excusing one another saying hey this is actually this is all right to do you know, there is no conviction here from the conscience so your your conscience is like your personal thoughts on what is good and bad based on the inherent laws that you know in your heart written in your heart already as well as the ones that you learn that you may learn laws about god and that can change your conscience because your knowledge changes right so this is why we can't change commandments but what we can change when we try and discuss convictions is we can change people's opinions right because it can be based on what you know about god's word what you've been taught already and what you learn and things like that now let's talk about principles and how to determine our convictions because if our convictions are, are not necessarily just clearly stated in the Bible because we've got commands, how then does our, how is our conscience swayed when it comes to things that are not so clear in the Bible, that are not just clearly stated? Well, let's go to a few passages we're going to go through. First one is 1 Corinthians 10. 1 Corinthians 10, and we'll get a few principles which will lead to questions that we can ask ourselves when it comes to matters of conviction, doubtful disputations. Because remember, commands, we don't question, right? If it's a command, not question meaning we can understand these things. I don't mean that we don't question the logic of it. I'm saying that we don't question whether it's right or wrong, a command, right? A command we do whether we like it or not, whether we believe it's right or not. Convictions are things that we believe to be right or wrong, but are not clearly stated. So how do we deal with these matters of the conscience? First, first Corinthians 10. What say I then? That the idol is anything? Or that which is offered in sacrifice to idols is anything? So what's the context of this passage? It's eating things sacrificed to idols, right? But I say that the things which the Gentiles sacrifice, they sacrifice to devils and not to God. And I would not that you should have fellowship with devils. So what is he saying here? He's saying, when it comes to idols, I mean, uh, is, is, a, is that statue really anything? Is that idol anything? He's saying, no, like when they sacrifice things to idols, I mean, it's just a statue. It has no power to change the food or anything. But he's saying the problem is that when the Gentile sacrifices to idols, they're actually fellowshipping with devils, and you ought not to have fellowship with devils. That's what he's saying. That's, the, that's one of the problems that we have to consider when it comes to eating things sacrificed to idols. He says, you cannot drink the cup of the Lord and the cup of devils. You cannot be partakers of the Lord's table and of the table of devils. So it's the fellowship that is happening. It's not the actual physical materials and whatnot or the food itself. Do we provoke the Lord to jealousy? Are we stronger than he? All things are lawful for me, but all things are not expedient. Because See, because some people might have the frame of mind, well, hey, if it's not commanded, if it's not prohibited by the word of God, then... I should be able to do it right and that's the wrong attitude to have just because it's not a sin to do that doesn't mean it's right to do because what is the bible saying here it's saying all things are lawful for me now remember in the context of things that are doubtful right even in first corinthians 10 he's not saying here all things meaning you can just sin and it's okay so obviously sin is still wrong but when it comes to things like you know eating things sacrificed to idols that's why he's saying hey you can eat these things are not wrong to eat 
right? It's lawful for you to eat those things because what is the idol anything? But look at what he says here. All things are not expedient. All things are lawful for me, but all things edify not. So just because it's not a sin to do, that doesn't mean it's okay to do. What do we have to consider? Hey, is it expedient? Is it right to do? Right? Based on our conscience. Is it edifying to do? Is this going to do something good for me? Is it going to help somebody else? And here's a good principle here. Let no man seek his own, but every man another's well. And this is the main idea of 1 Corinthians 10 here when it comes to these doubtful disputations, these matters of the conscience, is we ought to have other people in mind. See, when we start having the attitude of, hey, well, it's not wrong for me to do. It's not anyone's business. You know, it's like, I don't care how it affects anybody else. See, that already is what is the sin here in this passage. Because the sin here is that we're not considering other people. But when we go about things of conviction, we ought to consider others, how it affects others, how it's going to um, be edifying to others and to ourselves. And we want to seek not our own, but every man another's well. Whatsoever is sold in the shambles, that eat, asking, for no, que- not asking no questions for conscience sake. Right? So he's saying when you, know, when, when you eat something, hey, it might have been offered to idols, but it doesn't, you know, it doesn't matter. Because it doesn't matter because what is the idol? It's, 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 it's nothing. So he's saying when you eat in the shambles, what's the shambles? A shambles is like a marketplace. So imagine if you're like eating, or maybe now we don't really have street markets around here, but you go out and you eat, hey, maybe that restaurant owner in his, in his, his secret is, is offering his food and praying to his idol, and then he's offering, he's, he's serving that food. Now if you go and eat at that restaurant, are you in sin eating that stuff, not knowing? Or even if you do know, does it, does it matter if you're just going there and picking up something to eat? Think about when people think about halal. Right? People say, like, hey, is it wrong to eat halal? I mean, is, is an idol anything? You know, if you pick up something and it happens to be halal, have you sinned? No. So he said, you can just eat it. Right? Asking no question for conscience sake. For the earth is the Lord's and the fullness thereof. But, he says, if any of them that believe not bid you to a feast. So now this is different. He's saying, hey, you're not just going and just getting something to eat. You know, you pick something up. Maybe it's halal, maybe it isn't. What does it, what does it matter, right? Because idols... Are nothing but he says hey now if somebody actually bids you to a feast and ye be disposed to go so you go okay well, i'll go along to this unbelievers party whatever they're doing whatsoever is said before you eat asking no question for conscience sake so he says if they if, if you know that they're a pagan or they don't believe on jesus christ and they serve you something you just eat it you know it's not that big of a deal but then he says here but if any man say unto you this is offered in sacrifice unto idols. Eat not for his sake that showed it, and for conscience sake, for the earth is the Lord's and the fullness thereof. So now the situation is different. Now he's saying, hey, I want you to come eat, and you know what? Hey, I've, this, is a, this, is a, this is actually a spiritual meal. Where we've offered this to, in sacrifice to an idol, and we want you to partake with us. At that point, you say no, because it's not that there's anything wrong with the food. It's that you don't want to have fellowship with devils, right? like we read before. So now he's saying, eat not for his sake that showed it, and for conscience sake, for the earth is the Lord's and the fullness thereof. So isn't it interesting that for the same reason it may be right or wrong to do based on the situation? He's saying, hey, there's nothing wrong with eating that food because the earth is the Lord's and the fullness thereof. But if somebody says, hey, we're going to fellowship with devils, you don't eat because why? The earth is the Lord's and the fullness thereof. Conscience, I say, and this is the verse we read before, not thine own. Right? So it's not that you don't eat it because your own conscience is convicting you. He's saying because the other person believes that they're eating and eating in sacrifice to idols and fellowshipping with devils. So you don't eat for their conscience, but for the other. For why is my liberty judged of another man's conscience? For if I by grace be a partaker of the food, why am I evil spoken of for that which I give thanks? So he's saying, hey, if I'm grateful for what God has provided for me, why should I be evil spoken of? Whether therefore ye eat or drink or whatsoever ye do, do all to the glory of God. So that's where we get that passage from. And that's why it says, whether therefore ye eat or drink or whatsoever ye do. Because in the context, it's talking about eating in the wrong scenarios, right? And giving us an example of how our conscience should operate when a scenario like that is brought up, how we should behave. Whether therefore ye eat or drink, and whatsoever ye do, do all to the glory of God. 
Give none offence. What is that saying? Don't offend, don't do wrong by people by not uh, paying attention to what is right or wrong by the conscience. Neither to the Jews, nor to the Gentiles, nor to the church of God. Even as I please all men in all things, not seeking mine own profit, but the profit of many, that they may be saved. So that is an interesting point at the end. That that's what we want to think about in the end, because we may offend somebody by saying, hey, you know, it's not right for me to eat this, but we're not actually, they may get upset because we use that term, that they get offended. But you would actually do wrong by them. You would actually offend them by eating with them and allowing them to fellowship with devils. So that's why we want to take the stand and say, no, I shouldn't do this because we ultimately want them to be saved and want them to know um, that it's not right to fellowship with gods that are not the Lord Jesus Christ because they are false gods. Now, what we learn in 1 Corinthians 10 is it matters, it matters how your actions affect other people. Right? So that's why one thing you've got to think about when you think of matters of the conscience is other people. How does it affect them and, and is it good for them? And I've often heard this saying that has been taught to me, the heart of the matter is a matter of the heart. And that's what we learned in 1 Corinthians 10. Hey, what is the heart of the matter? The heart of the matter is what are you intending? How are you helping these other people? What, where is your heart at? And sometimes that can sway your conscience on whether something is right or wrong to do. Let's look at a couple of other examples. Let's go to, through Romans 14 and uh, we'll see a similar passage here. Him that is weak in the faith, receive ye, but not to doubtful disputations. So another way we can call convictions are doubtful disputations. Why are they called doubtful disputations? Because they're things that we dispute over, there are things we don't agree over, but they, they are doubtful, meaning like we don't really know for sure whether they are right or wrong because they are personal convictions. Now we're given some examples. For one believeth that he may eat all things, another who is weak eateth herbs. Now there are some issues of conviction where the Bible actually gives us, God actually gives us his opinion on these convictions. Not all these convictions that we are given information about, but we can see here that somebody who thinks it's not okay to eat meat actually has a weaker faith. Why? Because the Bible allows us to eat meat. But it says here, one believeth that he may eat all things, another who is weak eateth herbs. Now people have good reason for why they believe they shouldn't eat meat. You know, maybe they believe, oh, you know, God created the animals, and, you know, we should be taking care of the animals. They help us. They work for us. Why should we be eating them? You know, but you can see, like, this is not necessarily based on the Bible, right? Like, it's not wrong to eat animals because, obviously, in the animals, Jesus ate fish and whatnot. But you see how it's a conviction because it's not a sin to be a vegetarian. Whilst we are allowed to eat meat, you can see why it's an area of conviction because that doesn't mean you're not commanded to eat meat. Does that make sense? So you see how, you know, if somebody says, no, you must eat meat, right, because Jesus ate meat or whatnot, now you're turning a conviction into a commandment. Right? As a, your conviction is that you must eat meat. So whilst we are allowed to eat meat in the Bible, we have passages where God has given us that meat. He has not commanded us to eat meat. So if somebody for some reason decides to refrain from eating meat, they're not in sin. That's why this is something of a doubtful disputation. People may have reasons. Like I said, they may want to care for the animals. They, they might think that it's violent. Or maybe they think it's unhealthy. Maybe they think, you know what? God in the Garden of Eden... You know, you've probably heard this argument. God in the Garden of Eden, in a perfect world, they weren't eating meat. And some people believe, hey, that's what God intended. You know, it's a perfect world, so I will refrain from eating meat for whatever reason, right? Maybe they just don't like meat. You know, they just don't like to eat meat. Some people just don't like the taste of meat. They, maybe they grew up in a vegetarian family or they grew up in a vegan family and they literally, just the, even though they know it's not wrong to eat meat, they just literally, the thought of eating meat just, just makes them dis disgusted at it. I know people, it takes them a while. It takes vegetarians sometimes when they get saved to get over that and, and be, be able to eat meat comfortably. Uh, and that's fine. You know, they don't. You know, their, their faith is a bit weaker, but it's okay. Everyone has areas that they need to grow in. 
Let not him that eateth despise him that eateth not. So you see how here it's saying, hey, if somebody has a decision, has a conviction not to eat meat, you shouldn't hate that brother or condemn them for that. Just understand why they have that conviction. And you, know, you can love and try and convince them and encourage them to increase their faith. And let not him which eateth not judge him that eateth. So likewise, sometimes people have these convictions and they feel holier than other people. Right, saying, hey, look at me, like I am living like in the Garden of Eden. You know, I don't eat meat. Look at you barbarians, you know, or whatnot. For God hath received him. Who art thou that judgest another man's servant? To his own master he standeth or falleth. Yea, he shall be holden up, for God is able to make him stand. So this is where these passages, you don't want to understand these passages or people use these passages out of context, right? So the context here is judging people based on doubtful disputations. It's not that you don't judge somebody for committing adultery. You don't judge somebody for committing murder, for bearing false witness, for stealing, for extortion, for covetousness. You know, these things obviously ought to be judged, right, and dealt with. And it's not that you can't also discern convictions too. We're talking about condemning somebody, right, despising them. Right, setting them at naught, as we see later on. God is able to make him stand. What's another example we're given in Romans 14? One man esteemeth one day above another, another esteemeth every day alike. Let every man be fully persuaded in his own mind. So how do we apply this one? Well, it comes to holy days. Some people, you know, set days apart, whether it comes to traditions like Christmas and Easter, but also issues of birthdays, birthdays, anniversaries. You know, other special days. Maybe you have a tradition in your family where you do something on a certain day, right? Now, the Jehovah's Witnesses are famous for this, right? They're famous for, you know, you do not celebrate birthdays, you do not celebrate Christmas. It's all pagan, you know, because circles are pagan, triangles are pagan, the number 25 is pagan. I mean, everything's pagan these days, right? But this, is, this, is, this addresses this issue, right? One man esteems one day above another. Some people lift up one day. Some people say, you know what, on Sundays, they say Sundays is a special day. I treat it differently. I don't work on Sundays. You know, should you prioritize church? Yeah. Obviously, church should be prioritized on Sunday because we have it on Sundays. Because of, and, and this also is a tradition that is passed down, right? Because we're not commanded to have church on Sundays. That's just what we do. Right? What we do is why? Because Jesus rose on the first day of the week. So it's been a tradition that has been passed down that Christians meet on the first day of the week to worship the Lord Jesus Christ, remember his death, burial, and resurrection. But it's not actually a command. Some churches have it on other days of the week. But when they start saying, you must have it on this day of the week, you know, this day is a different day than every other day. And they say, oh, the Sunday is the new Sabbath, which we don't believe. If people want to esteem one day above another, they can't. If they, want to make, if they want to treat Sunday special in their mind to different other days and they think, hey, this is a holy day and the rest of the days are unholy days, that's entirely up to them. Likewise, you know, we don't condemn somebody that thinks that. We might try and convince them, hey, you don't need to think that. But then likewise, somebody who believes that should not condemn somebody that just esteems every day alike. What does that mean? Every day is the same. It's just another day. Let every man be fully persuaded in his own mind. So this is where you can see the conscience here. Remember their thoughts, accusing, or the meanwhile excusing one another. So it's saying when issues of the conscience, your conviction, hey, everyone, as long as you're fully persuaded in your own mind, that that's right, you should keep that. If you're not fully persuaded in your own mind, then you don't need to keep it. These are issues of the conscience. He that regardeth the day, regardeth it unto the Lord. And he, and he that regardeth not the day, to the Lord he doth not regard it. So you see, it's like whether you... See, whether you do it, it's not that, because people get this idea, well, you just don't care about God because you don't want to keep one day special for him. And it's like, no, because the person that doesn't, he's just like saying every day is for God. <laughs> so you see how people can get this mindset of, hey, if you regard it, he's saying, hey, if they regard it, give them the benefit of the doubt that they're doing it for God. And if they don't regard it, still give them the benefit of the doubt that they are trying to serve God the best of their ability. They just don't think one day should be esteemed above another. To the Lord, he doth not regard. He that eateth, so now he goes back to the other example. Hey, if you eat meat or not, eateth to the Lord, for he giveth God thanks. And he that eateth not, to the Lord he eateth not, and giveth God thanks. So it's not that if somebody doesn't eat meat, it's like, oh, you're not grateful for what God gave you to eat, to enjoy. 
See, this is the wrong mindset to have. It's to understand people's convictions and then say, hey, well, you can discuss them as brothers and sisters in Christ. You know, maybe you can change somebody's convictions. Um, but you ought not to condemn them. Or like it says here, you know, that you, you regard... Um, they really don't regard it, eat it, give it God thanks, or think people are not doing things for the sake of God. For none of us liveth to himself, and no man dieth to himself. So now he's saying here, well, give people the benefit of the doubt that everyone is trying to live for God. Yeah, everyone's trying to live for God, but we have a difference in convictions. For whether we live, we live unto the Lord, and whether we die, we die unto the Lord. Whether we live therefore or die, we are the Lord's. For to this end, so now he brings up Jesus Christ, for to this end Christ both died and rose and revived, that he might be Lord both of the dead and of the living. So whether you do or you don't, in areas of doubtful disputations, you live your life for God. And this is why Christ died, so that he can you know, uh, allow us to live this way. But why dost thou judge thy brother? Or why dost thou set at naught thy brother? For we shall all stand before the judgment seat of Christ. For it is written, as I live, saith the Lord, every knee shall bow to me and every tongue shall confess. So then every one of us shall give account of himself to God. So what is this passage saying here in Romans 14? This is saying, well, there are areas of sin, right, which is commandment, and there are areas of conviction. And we allow people to exercise their liberty, how they're going to exercise those convictions. Why? Because they, they are going to answer for, to God for how they live their life. So you know how sometimes you'll hear me say, well, that's an issue between you and God, of whether you do it or not. This is sort of what I'm referring to. Well, when you answer to God, you're going to answer to God for what you allowed or didn't allow in your life. right? So this is what he's saying here. You don't need to condemn that person for a conviction that they have, because if it is wrong, if it was wrong by their conscience, they're going to stand before God and give account for why they allowed that. And they, they may gain or lose rewards. You don't need to stand in God's place to judge something that you don't know is 100% clear. You know, like I said, you can convince them to change their convictions if you don't agree, and that's, a, that's fine for that discussion to have. That's not judging your brother or sister. Like, you can say, hey, look, I don't think it's this way, and you have a discussion about it in love, um, but condemning somebody or hating somebody and just writing them off, that's what we ought not to do. Let's go on. Let us not therefore judge one another anymore, but judge this brother, that no man put a stumbling block on an occasion to fall in his brother's way. So again, this judging, like I said, is not just discerning right and wrong, not discerning commandments. It's talking about doubtful disputations. That no man, what is he saying here? So don't, you don't have to despise people and condemn them just for their convictions. Just make sure you are not encouraging people to actually sin. That's what the Bible is saying here. So don't, don't worry about, don't condemn people for their convictions. Just make sure you're not condemning them by actually causing them to sin and putting a stumbling block in their way or an occasion to fall in his brother's way. Right? That your liberty is not putting people in a situation where they may not have as strong convictions as you and then they go actually into sin. Right? And we see that, you know, maybe like company you hang around. Right? Like company you hang around and you think, well, hey, it's not, it's not wrong to have a beer. But then a guy that's like not so strong as you drinks too many and then actually gets drunk and gets into sin and you've actually encouraged that behavior because of the liberty you believe you have. So we need to be careful of how we affect other people. I know and am persuaded by the Lord Jesus that there is nothing unclean in and of itself. Again, in the context of doubtful disputations. Right? So you don't want to get a verse like this and somebody says, say, like, say, see, sin doesn't apply in the New Testament anymore. There's nothing unclean in and of itself. So that's why he's saying it's nothing unclean in and of itself because these are these temporary things back in the Old Testament that some people still believed were wrong to do. But to him that esteemeth anything to be unclean, look at this, to him it is unclean. So again, remember when we went to 1 Corinthians 10? It's about asking your conscience... Am I doing what's right by other people? Romans 14 is about being fully persuaded in your own mind. If you are fully persuaded that it's right to do, that it's right to do. If you're fully persuaded it's wrong to do, you shouldn't sin against your conscience. That's why it says here, if you esteem something to be unclean, not right to do, to him it is unclean. So it's not that to him that esteemeth anything to be unclean, to everyone else it is also unclean. 
which is how some people treat their convictions, right? If it's wrong for me, and nobody else should do it, and if they do it, you know, I condemn them. No, it's to him it is unclean, right? So your own conscience convicts you. That's why you never sin against your conscience. If you believe something to be wrong, you shouldn't do it, unless it's a clear command, right? If it's a clear command, it doesn't matter what your conscience thinks, right? You're, that means you're, you're reading your thoughts wrong, right? But if it's issues of doubtful disputation and you think, you know what, I don't know whether this is not a clear command, I'm not sure whether it's right to do, then you shouldn't do it. You know, you don't, you don't sin against your own conscience. And if thy brother be grieved with thy meat, now walkest thou not charitably. Destroy not him with thy meat for whom Christ died. So this is going back to 1 Corinthians 10, right? We consider others. Let not then your good be evil spoken of, for the kingdom of God is not meat and drink, but righteousness and peace and joy in the Holy Ghost. For he that in these things serveth Christ is acceptable to God and approved of men. Let us therefore follow after the things which make for peace and things wherewith one may edify another. For meat, destroy not the work of God. You can see here, that is, like what you eat, it's saying it's not worth just destroying somebody's faith or destroying somebody's walk with the Lord just based on something that is of doubtful disputation. But it is evil for the man who eateth with offense. So what is he saying here? If you do something that is not necessarily sinful, but you know it's going to have a negative effect on somebody else, you are wrong in doing that, right? Knowing that it's going to have a negative effect on somebody else. So you can apply this to, say, the way women dress, right? So if a woman goes, you know what? It's not a sin for me to wear tight clothes. It's not a sin. You know, you can't tell me it's a sin to wear a mini skirt. You know, to walk around in my undies or whatever. To, it's not a sin to wear like a, a shirt that's really low, showing my cleavage. But if you, like this principle says, you eat with offense. If you dress with offense, if you know, and, and, and it's, it's pretty clear to all of us, if you know that people will look at you for the way you dress, and you dress that way, then you are in sin. Right, because your conscience is already telling you, I'm not considering my brothers in Christ. I'm not considering other people. I'm not considering how people will think about me and how people will may lust after me. That's when you are now eating with offence. It is good neither to eat flesh nor to drink wine or anything whereby thy brother stumbleth or is offended or is made weak. So it's saying, hey, sometimes it's better just to refrain at all from it, to, to hurt somebody. Hast thou faith? Have it to thyself before God. Happy is he that condemneth not himself in that thing which he allowed, allowed. And he that doubteth is damned if he eat, because he eateth not of faith, for whatsoever is not of faith is sin. So we get this principle at the end here, how we judge our convictions, or whether you believe it's right or not. So what it's saying here, hey, if you do something and it's not of faith, you don't believe it's right, and yet you do it anyway, you are now in sin. Now James 4 frames it a different way in verse 17. Therefore to him that knoweth to do good and doeth it not, to him it is sin. So in Romans 14 we see how hey, you don't think it's right to do. If you do, do it anyway, you're in sin. But in James 4 verse 17 it's saying, hey, if you know it's right to do and you don't do it, that is sin to you. So this is how we judge issues of the conscience. So what are some questions that we can ask ourselves when we think, well, it's not a clear command of God. How do I decide whether it is right or wrong to do? So based on the passages we just looked at, is this the right thing to do? Is it the right thing to do? Am I putting God first? Remember, whether ye eat or drink or whatsoever ye do, do all to the glory of God. Right? So am I doing what's right by God? Am I putting God first? What's another one? Am I doing my best? Am I trying to do my best? Am I doing what's right by others? Am I considering the needs and shortcomings of others when I do something? So you say, well, it's not wrong for me to do. But like, like with the areas of dress, are you considering other people's shortcomings? What, will what I do encourage another to do right or wrong? That's another thing you can ask yourself to think, hey, will my conscience be fine with this? Will what I do cause another to stumble, put a stumbling block or an occasion to fall in my brother's way. So let's talk through just some examples now of, of different areas of conviction where people often do um, talk about, uh, uh, do make them com commandments. And we already talked about the areas of food and drink. So I won't spend too much time on that because when I went through it 
um, I already went through 1 Corinthians 10 and Romans 14. So in terms of you know, eating vegetarian, eating halal, I would say the same as well. Eating at restaurants of unbelievers. Now what about other more questionable areas? Like, what about drugs? Is it a sin, is it a sin to consume drugs? You may, you may say, as a Christian, well, of course it's a sin to consume drugs. Well, you may say, well, what, you know, if you're taking heroin or taking cocaine and stuff, what makes these things wrong? Is it the fact that you're, you're taking in a certain substance? No, generally what makes these things wrong is it because it affects your sobriety. Right? So that's the problem with alcohol, too much alcohol, it affects your sobriety. Now, if you take hard drugs, Sometimes you just take a little bit and you're already not with it, right? You're already not sober anymore, not thinking, you're hallucinating and whatnot. But when people say, well, is it, is it wrong to smoke? People say, is it a sin to smoke? Do we have a command in the Bible where it says, thou shalt not smoke? Thou shalt not light up some certain type of plant and inhale the smoke? Get some and you say like, well, you know, you don't have to, it doesn't have to be in there for it to be a sin. Well, no, it does have to be in there for it to be a commandment. It doesn't have to be in there for it to be a conviction. This is why people can justify like, hey, well, if you can drink coffee, right? Take in that caffeine and get a good hit. Why is it wrong to smoke? Hey, if it's okay for you to eat sugar and get a nice hit, you know, feel nice, what's wrong with smoking? So you can see how it's an area of the conviction. Now, am I saying, therefore, smoke? You know, because my conviction is it's not good for you. Right? It's not healthy. But you can see how it's not a commandment. Why don't I smoke? Right? It's because I don't think it's healthy for you. So it's a conviction of mine that if I should take care of myself, I don't smoke. Why don't I drink coffee? Is it because I think it's unhealthy? No. I just don't like the buzz that coffee gives me. <laughs> so people, sometimes people, you know, people go, oh, you want to have a coffee? And it's like, ah, oh, no, I don't really drink coffee. They're like thinking, do you think it's is it a conviction that you think it's a sin to drink coffee? No, I just, I just don't like coffee. First Corinthians 6, look here. All things are lawful unto me. Hey, look, doesn't this sound familiar? This is not the same passage. This is not First Corinthians 10. Um, this is First Corinthians 6. All things are lawful unto me. All things are not expedient. All things are lawful for me. But look at this but I will not be brought under the power of any. So you see, this is one, another issue with drugs, is not just the sobriety, but it's also the addiction. Right? So is it wrong for somebody, is it sinful in and of itself for somebody to have one cigarette? Is it sinful for somebody to have one coffee? But you know what, if you're like, I can't do without cigarettes, I have to have my coffee, this is when you're now treading into sinful territory, right? Because now you are addicted to something and that is a sin, right? We should not be brought under the power of any. Meats for the belly and belly for meats. But God shall destroy both it and them. Now the body is not for fornication, but for the Lord and the Lord for the body. So again, fornication is another way we can sin. God hath both raised up the Lord and will also raise up us. By his own power. Know ye not that your bodies are the members of Christ? Shall I then take the members of Christ and make them the members of an harlot? God forbid. What? Know ye not that he which is joined to an harlot is one body? For two, saith he, shall be one flesh. But he that is joined unto the Lord is one spirit. Flee fornication. Every sin that a man doeth is without the body. But he that committeth fornication sinneth against his own body. Look at this. What? Know ye not that your body is the temple of the Holy Ghost? which is in you, which ye have of God, and ye are not your own. For ye are bought with a price, therefore glorify God in your body and in your spirit, which are God's. Now often when it comes to issues of the body, like health, healthy eating, healthy drinking, you know, drugs and whatnot, a lot of people will point to this passage and say, hey, don't you know your body is a temple of the Holy Ghost? You ought to glorify God in your body. Now what is the commandment? The commandment is to glorify God in your body. What, is, what are the convictions? How we are to glorify God in our body. Right? So the conviction is that we take care of our body and we treat our body with, you know, we, we stay healthy, the things that we eat. That is the conviction that is built off 
the commandment to glorify God in our bodies, that our bodies don't belong to us. So if your body doesn't belong to you, you shouldn't trash your body, just like you shouldn't trash possessions to somebody else. But you see how this is a conviction that people have. Now what about when it comes to alcohol? Look, Ephesians 5. Be not drunk with wine wherein is excess, but be filled with the Spirit. So the commandment is that we are not drunk with wine wherein it is excess. But some people have the conviction, well, because you shouldn't be drunk with wine, I'm not going to drink wine, I'm not going to drink alcohol at all. But that is a conviction that they have. The conviction is for them to be, you know, teetotalism, which is to not drink it at all. But the commandment is that we do not get drunk. So you see the difference between a commandment and a conviction. Now somebody might say, well, hey, well, we're commanded not even to look at alcohol. And then we go to that passage, and I think it's, it's not as simple as that. Look at Proverbs 23. Look not thou upon the wine when it is red. So I think often people misquote this passage just to say, hey, well, we shouldn't even look at the substance of alcohol. But it's saying, hey, look not upon the wine when it is red. Now, what does that mean? People dispute over what this may mean. But you can't just use this passage to make a commandment that people should not even look at alcohol. Because the, the, even if you take this as a commandment, look not thou upon the wine when it is red, does that mean you can look at wine when it's not red? You know, you can look at beer, you can look at spirits, you just can't look at red wine. And, and you know, like, that's why some people, they take these commands to father, they're like, oh, I don't even walk down the aisle of the alcohol, I'm not even meant to look at it. It's like you can't even like, like accidentally look at it because now it's a sin. So that's why I think this, this idea of um, teetotalism is, is a conviction that people have. And it's fine for them to have that conviction. Like we said, we don't condemn people to have that conviction. And likewise, if people think it's okay to have a little bit of alcohol, then that's fine. But the sin is when people have too much. So we know when you're drunk, you're in sin. Now, we already talked about special days, so I don't want to spend too much time on that one, but holidays and whatnot, we talked about it when we were in Romans 14. Uh, what about issues of conscience in the church? There are matters of conviction when it comes to how the church is run as well, but there are issues that are not of the conscience. 1 Corinthians 14. Look, let your women keep silence in the churches, for it is not permitted unto them to speak, but they are commanded to be under, dis under obedience as also saith the law. Now, what is the reason why a church should not have women preachers? Because this is a command of God that women, when it comes to the teaching here of the congregation, women do not address the congregation. They are to keep silence during the address of the congregation. If they will learn anything, let them ask their husbands at home, for it is a shame for women to speak in the church. Now, remember, the church is not this building. So it's not that you come into this building and then you're not allowed to talk. It's the address here. See how we are all gathered. Everyone's here and we're at attention. This is what the congreg this is what the church is. So it's a shame for women to speak in this congregation. Now, when it says here, I just want to give you my thoughts here. It says if they will learn anything, let them ask their husbands at home. Now, I don't what I don't think this means is, you know, after we're kind of dismissed here and we're eating afterwards and we're talking, that if somebody has a question about the message or they learn like they learn something from the preaching that they can't ask somebody and get clarification. What I think this is talking about, because it's in the context of women teaching the church, right? So to me, it's saying, hey, if, maybe if something is revealed to them, they then don't teach the church. They should ask their husband at home about, hey, is this right or not? You know, and then their husband may bring that up at the church if they're in a position to speak. That's what I think that is referring to, um, just so it's consistent. Uh, what? Came the word of God out from you, or came it unto you only? If any man think himself to be a prophet or spiritual, let him acknowledge that the things that I write unto you are the commandments of the Lord. But if any man be ignorant, let him be ignorant. Wherefore, brethren, covet to prophesy, forbid not to speak with tongues, let all things be done decently and in order. So, this is the passage that people generally go to when they talk about how things are run at church. Right, they'll say, hey, why do we have things at church like this? Because everything should be done decently and in order. So what is the command here? The command is that everything be done in decency, decently and in order. But what is the conviction? How you do things to go about things decently and in order. So churches sometimes condemn one another for how they do things. You know, their order of service. 
You have not enough hymns, too little hymns. You preach too long, well, probably that one, right? Preach too long. Other ones are, you preach too short. You know, so it's just, these are just matters of conviction. You know, do you have two people preach, one person preach? More, like, how many songs? Do you have a song leader up here, not have a song leader? Do you have people up here singing together? And the people, these are just all matters of conviction, right? What people believe to do is right or wrong. So let me list off a few. The order of service we talked about. What about the name of the church? Now, that is one where people get really riled up about, like whether you use a label or not. You know, and people will separate over those things. They'll say like, hey, if you don't have Baptist in the name, we don't want to set with fellowship with your church. So you can see how people are condemning setting their brother at naught over matters of conviction, not things that are actually done. Like we're not given any command in the Bible of how to name the church. We're not given any command in the Bible how the order of service is. I don't remember reading that passage saying you must have him, him, announcements, prayer, you know, like the way we do. This is just the, con like the way this church is run. It's just a conglomeration of my convictions, right? What I believe and my preferences too, right? So not everything we do here is just conviction. It's also preference. It's how I like things to be done, uh, being the leader here. What about titles? It's another thing in church, how you address people. Some people have a conviction that younger people should address, you know, Mr. and Mrs. Victor or Mr. Tay, Mrs. Tay. Some people have that conviction. Now, some people prefer to be addressed that way and say, you know what, I prefer to be referred to as Mr. Tay or Mrs. Tay. I'll respect that. I'm not going to say, oh, who are you, Holy? You want to use the title? Like, what's up with you? You know, and have that sort of attitude. No, if people believe that's respectful, I'll respect them with that. But, you know, I don't care whether people call me Mr. or Mr. you know, call me Victor or not. I don't care if people call me Pastor or not. To me, to me, I believe, my conviction is these things are unbiblical, right? Because you don't see people addressing people by titles in the Bible. They address each other by their first names. So I think we should follow that pattern. But it's not a command. See, this is why you have to realize. That's why I don't say it's wrong for people to do that. I don't condemn churches that have that culture. Because it's a conviction of mine that it's not done that way, and that's why I don't do it. Uh, you know, people have children's church at different times. Again, this is a conviction. How people run their church is a conviction, and people have preferences there. The type of music, that is a huge one, because people will say, hey, well, you have this music, it's got this beat, it uses this instrument, oh, that's ungodly, that's worldly, that's, you know, a sin. But in the Bible, we're not told what instruments are right or wrong. What, I, I don't remember reading a passage about a beat pattern or, or, or a pattern of notes that was sinful. So that's why these are areas of conviction. And people can have these convictions, that's fine, but we can't condemn others for the convictions that they have. Altar calls. Offerings. You know, how, we, how we take up offerings. Um, you know, that's a conviction of mine that I just prefer not to do a public offering where it's passed through and everyone's watching. I, I, that's, why, that's why we have the box. If you're wondering why in our church, why do we have a box over there as opposed to, you know, have a time of offering where people come up and they pass the bags through? You know, I just didn't like the culture it created where it's kind of, you know, people are giving them, wondering how people are watching them. Do I put my, do I put my hand in the bag? Because I remember I was in a church, people just put their hand in the bag and they don't put anything in there because they don't want other people to think that they're not giving, yeah. right? Because they may be direct deposit, but then they direct deposit money into the bank, but then when the offering is, I don't get the honor of like, you know, pretending I put something into the bag. So I just, I didn't like that. Um, so I just prefer, you know what, it's between you and God, you know, I appreciate people that give. Obviously there's an expectation to give, but I don't want it to be something that's seen. If you direct deposit, I don't want you to feel like you're not giving to the church because you don't have that public display of putting something in, into a bag. And I've, I've even heard people say things like, you know, I, I don't direct deposit because I want to take part in that offering, which is fine. But see, I just didn't want that, that and that's why I did it that way here. Uh, dress standards is a huge one. These areas, I already talked about that one when it comes to the way ladies dress. But it also comes to, it's also an issue of like whether or not church should be formal or not. You know, some people will come into a church like ours and go, oh, don't you guys respect God? You guys are dressed so casually. But then other, you know, other people are saying like, why do you want to look so different? You know, like I don't see in the Bible where you know, people are treating it so formal, like a formal occasion. So again, you can think back to Romans 14, you know, let not him that eateth judge him that eateth not. So it's like this in areas of dress. You don't go to a church and just think, oh, look at these people, they just think they're so holy. Likewise, people like that shouldn't come to our church and go, what, don't you guys respect God? 
you know, because it's an issue of the heart, right? How you dress, you know, what you do. How you dress is your own convictions playing out. Uh, what about the use of technology? You know, people will say, oh, you know, you look at you, you've gone soft and watered down because you've got technology in the church. Why don't you go old-fashioned? Everyone should bring their Bibles to church. This is a conviction, right, of whether or not you use paper Bibles, paper hymnals, uh, who you associate with. just want to run through some of these. Who you associate with, like different churches. These are convictions as well. What about this one? What about communion? How you go about communion? What does it mean to be worthy and not worthy? These are also convictions. Because the Bible doesn't always clearly state what it means to be that. That's why the way we practice communion here is a conviction of mine. Right? That's how I believe. That conviction can change. So that's why it can change in terms of, hey, well, this is what I understand now. That's why things can change. Your positions can change because your convictions can change. What about what you do communion with? Why is the bread unleavened and the juice unleavened? That's a conviction too, right? Because it's not a command in the Bible what to use. Some churches actually use just regular bread and fermented wine, right? But it's a conviction of mine at the moment not to do that because I think leaven represents sin. So it's represent the broken body and shed blood, the sinless body and shed blood, where some people can say, well, Jesus took on the sins of the world and it was broken. So they can have reason there as well. But that's why, just notice that the difference between the commandment, so we do the Lord's Supper, we do come in, but we, um, we have a conviction in how it's done. What about issues of appearance? Issues of appearance. So 1 Timothy 2, In like manner also, that women adorn themselves in modest apparel, with shamefacedness and sobriety, not with broidered hair or gold or pearls or costly array, but which becometh women professing godliness with good works. So notice how the command, or here, is that we adorn ourselves in modest apparel. Now, if we take this to the nth degree, we can say, ah, oh, well, this only applies to women. So women are only commanded to be modest apparel. But are men, should men dress in modest apparel? But you see here that this is where the conviction comes in now. Or it sort of makes sense, conscience-wise, hey, it's wrong for a woman to be immodest. Likewise, it would be wrong for a man to be immodest. And I always joke and say, well, it's, it's addressed at a woman, woman, because only women should really be concerned with what they wear. You know? I think God, assume, God maybe assumes that men will not do these things and therefore they won't take them overboard like we see today. But just dress down as even in your own life when it comes to how you dress. So the command is to be modestly dressed. And if we think about before, if you just dress in a way where you think, well, I don't care how it affects other people. I'm just going to dress slutty. I'm just going to dress like a whore. You know, and it's like, it's a, hey, it's like the slut walk, right? It's your problem if you lust after me. That's the sinful attitude, right? The sinful attitude where you're not thinking about how you look to others, especially of the opposite gender. So things like skirt length, is a conviction. You know, some people think, you know, you've got to go to the knees. Now, is it, is it wise for it to go up higher? And I don't think so, because I think it's getting a little bit close. It's getting a bit suggestive, right? But some people say, like, you know, like, knees is not enough. They'll say, like, you know, you've got to go all the way down to the floor, you know, because you're just showing too much skin. Now, if people have that conviction, that's fine, right? But it's a, you just, we just need to understand it's a conviction so that we can, don't condemn. Like, if a woman's wearing a dress, you don't go, oh, look at you, you slut. Like, you look at all this skin that you're showing, right? So that's what it's condemning in the Bible. So skirt length. Even tightness, right? The tightness of it, the materials that it uses, the flashiness of your clothes, how flashy you want to dress is a conviction. Uh, what about, uh, what about the, the, the color of clothing? Do we realize that that's a conviction? When we say, hey, boys should wear blue, girls should wear pink, this is a conviction because it's not in the Bible, right? So it's not in the Bible that it's a sin for a, girl, for a boy to play with dolls. It's not a sin for a girl to wear pink, a, a guy to wear pink, right? Because sometimes, like, you know, it's, it's funny because, like, my kids will play with dolls. They, they play with dolls, but then they, they have all the dinosaurs and the robots around the dolls, you know? But you get what I'm saying? So it's, it's not wrong in and of itself, but it's a conviction that we want them to be masculine, we want them to be feminine. This is how it plays out when it comes with clothing, when it comes with certain types of toys, uh, maybe jewellery for men as well. You say, well, is it wrong for a man to have an earring? 
Well, no, it's not a sin for a man to have an earring, but why don't men, why, why do I believe, what is my conviction, men shouldn't wear too much jewellery? Because I think it's a very feminine thing, right? Just like the clothing, men having fancy clothes, expensive shoes. I mean, some guys these days have shoe collections. Yeah. Like that, that to me, I, I, I never understood why guys had shoe collections. And then like my, my sister married a guy that has like a shoe collection. And then they have like, you know, their Air Jordans and all these different skate shoes. And it's just like, they, they, I think they're just a bit feminine. But that's my conviction, right? It's a bit feminine. Um, with the broided hair, and guys have this too, right? Broided hair, gold, pearls, or costly array. Guys wearing jewellery is a conviction. What about some other things? Like, have you ever heard people condemn people for mixed, mixed swimming? Do you guys know that one? Some people will be like, you know, when you go to the pool, men and women should not swim together. Why? Because they say, this is the reasoning. If you haven't heard the reasoning, see, if you guys aren't from Baptist circles, then you've never heard this stuff before, because Baptists are big on these things, these convictions. They say like, well, because when a, when a lady goes into, even if she's modest, right, she's wearing, because you, obviously, uh, you know, I would not be comfortable with women wearing like bikini and whatnot, because, you know, you're basically naked, you shouldn't, but let's say you're going to the beach and you're modest, you know, you're in some like knee length shorts, you're in a shirt, but they'll say, but once you get into the water, it's all tight. So that's why men and women should not swim together. So women, you go swim in a private pool. You know, that's why you never go to the beach, you know, because you can't go to the beach because things like that. So you can see how people's convictions start playing out into commandments where they start saying, you can't do this, you can't do that, where it's a, it's a conviction. Now, how do we change people's convictions? Like I said, you can convince them of your reasoning, but you can't just condemn them for not following your convictions. But like I said, you don't want to have the mindset of, well, just because it's not wrong, you can't tell me it's not wrong to do. You also, as a Christian, have a responsibility to think about how your actions play out. And if you, like I said, if you're not convinced that it's the right thing to do, if you put on that bikini and go, you know what, I'm not, I'm not doing right, and you do it anyway, then you are in sin. What's some others? Breastfeeding is one. Breastfeeding. Not in terms of to breastfeed or not. I suppose that's, that's another conviction, right? Another conviction is, you know, whether it's wrong to give your child formula or supplement with formula. And, you know, sometimes people get so carried away with it, they condemn women who, like, are you know, actually have a medical reason why they cannot breastfeed. And then they condemn them, saying, well, you should only give breast milk, right? You can't give formula. And they're just, like, trying to, just trying to make their baby survive. You know, it's, give them a break sometimes. So breastfeeding, but also like how, where you breastfeed. Some people believe it's wrong to breastfeed in public areas and this whole idea of you should go into a private room and whatnot. Now, do I think you should be covered? Yes. But that is my conviction. Why? Because you know it's not actually sinful to expose your breasts in and of itself. Did you know that? It's not actually sinful to see somebody's nakedness. Now, why should women not just go around showing their breasts? Well, the problem is because it's guys will lust after you, right? But when it comes to just breastfeeding, some people believe, well, if I, you know, if I don't cover myself, I don't want my baby to have the thing over them. That is not sinful in and of itself. Now, I don't practice that. I don't, I don't think it's a good idea. I think Elizabeth, as much as possible, you know, if she forgets to bring a cloth, she might turn away and, and breastfeed. But, you know, I think the lackadaisical attitude of women that just like, hey, I'm going to breastfeed. It's your problem if you lust after me. You, you notice how it's the attitude that's the problem. It's not the fact that she's revealing her breast. It's the fact she just doesn't care who sees her. And that's what I think is, is what makes it sinful to somebody who is, is not caring at all about how they are in public. Um, length of hair is another one, right? Length of hair. First Corinthians 11. Doth not even nature itself teach you that if a man have long hair, it is a shame unto him? But if a woman have long hair, it is a glory to her, for her hair is given her for a covering. Now notice, some people believe it's a sin for a man to have long hair. I don't think that's right. right? Because this is not what it says. Right? It doesn't say it's a, it's a sin for a man to have long hair. It's a shame for a man to have long hair. And if you think it's a sin for a man to have long hair, then you'll get caught up in Samson. Because you'll be like, because that's what people always ask, right? If it's a sin for a man to have long hair, why, why was Samson allowed to grow out his hair? Why the Nazarite vow says you don't cut your hair, you let it grow out wrong, uh, long. If it was a sin, it would be sin to take the Nazarite vow, right? So it's not a sin, it's, it's a shame in the sense, it's, it's something that's done like with prayer and fasting, that's why they got the Nazarite vow. So it's when somebody lets themselves go, but they ought not do it in this passage when they're, you know, 
for representing God in a public sphere, right? They had to be clean cut. Women likewise, if they represent God in the public sphere, is um, they should have long hair, right? So that's what it's saying here. But when it says, hey, a man, you shouldn't have long hair, people still disagree. Well, how long is long? Because some men might have like a bit of a shaggy hair and they say, oh, look, you got uh, hair like a woman. Yeah, well, how, how long is long? How short is short? See, these are issues of the conscience, issues of conviction. And the last one I just want to uh, briefly touch on is family, especially when it comes to uh, another application of uh, issues of the conscience is dating practices. You know, we've talked about dating in the last couple of weeks, uh, how people go about dating. And one passage people always go to when they talk about dating methods is 1 Thessalonians 5.22, abstain from all appearance of evil. Now this is the command, right? The command is that you abstain from all appearance of evil. So remember, this command is not just to abstain from evil in and of itself, sin and wrongdoing, it's you abstain from the appearance of it too. Now where it gets a bit tricky is people's convictions in how to apply this, because things can appear differently to different people. And this is where you get people saying, well, when you go date, you should always have a chaperone. When you date, you should like, you know, always be with people. You know, if you guys are just seen together, that looks like you're fornicating. But see, notice how these are all issues of the conscience. They're all convictions about how people go about things, right? Where they should meet, how they should meet, time of the day. Now, there is some wisdom there that will sway your conscience one way or the other. But notice that there is a difference between conviction and commandment. Um, another one is family planning. Genesis 1. God created man in his own image, in the image of God created him, male and female created he them. God blessed them and God said unto them, be fruitful and multiply and replenish the earth. So people will say here, well here's the command to be fruitful and to multiply. But does that command specify how frequently you have children, how many children you have in total? Because let's say you have three and you stop. Have you been fruitful and multiplied? Yeah, you've multiplied. But people will take this, their conviction will mean or that you can't use birth control methods at all, any birth control methods. Or you'll say that you must have children as quickly as possible. There's no reason ever to take break from children. So you can notice there the difference between the commandment, which yes, we are commanded to have children and to strive to be parents and to have as many children as possible. How that plays out is the conviction. What about schooling methods? Right, homeschooling versus sending, the, sending your kids to school. This is another conviction as well. Right? So when it comes to Deuteronomy 6, this is where people, they, they'll use this passage to teach homeschooling. And um, you know, obviously you can, you can base the homeschooling principle off it, but this is not commanding homeschooling in and of itself. Deuteronomy 6, These words which I command thee this day shall be in thine heart, and thou shalt teach them diligently unto thy children, and shalt talk of them. When thou sittest in thine house, and when thou walkest by the way, when thou liest down and when thou risest up. So I am, you guys know, I am all for homeschooling. I promote homeschooling. I think it's a good idea. I think if you can homeschool your kids, it is way better. You spend so much more time with them. You have so much more influence on them and you can control what they learn, you know, and you can protect them from evil people as well. Um, and you don't have to sort of roll the dice by um, taking your kid to a school. But not everybody is cut out for homeschool. You know, that's why it's not a commandment. And people come here and go like, see how it's singular, it's you, you must teach them, you must do it. But that doesn't mean you do everything for them. Because even homeschoolers do not do everything for their children. They take them to art class, they take them to sport class, they take them to this, they take them to that, they take them to play groups where one of the other parents will take the, take the kids and do an activity for them. I mean, newsflash, that's, that's what a school does, right? A school is just, the, the, the different, where I see the difference, and see, now you can start hearing my convictions come out, right? These are my convictions. Where I see the difference is where you have no contact with your kid at all for just six, seven hours of the day, and then you see them later, as opposed to a homeschooler that takes their child somewhere and they're there with them, influencing them and, and, part, and part of the activity, right? Not just sending them off to somebody for many, many hours of the day, right? And, and just doing that five days a week and then doing it with tutoring as well on Saturdays. And it's just, you never, when do you do this? Because I mean, somebody could argue 
But they can still do this. I mean, they still rise up with their children. They still walk with them to school. Well, by the way, you know, when they sit us down with their lifestyle, they still eat dinner with them. So somebody who doesn't homeschool can still argue, well, I'm keeping this commandment. I'm responsible for my kids. I'm with them. I'm teaching them all the time. But I just utilize uh, an organization just like you utilize people as well. So you can see how it's a conviction. But I definitely believe it's better to do one over the other. But I understand that it's my conviction. That's why I don't condemn people for utilizing schools and utilizing that. But I will say, hey, if you send your kids to school, send them to a, at least a Christian school. Don't send them to a Catholic school. If you send your kids to school, send them to a good Bible-believing school. There are good Bible-believing schools out there that are run by IFB churches and whatnot. There's one in Condal Park that a lot of parents bring their kids to. But, you know, if you can, and you can, you can, you can homeschool your kids. Everyone is capable. Of doing it you know when you look back at the things your kids learn in you know primary school you, you'll be shocked at how basic it is and you just think like yeah you know, any, anybody could teach this what 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 I think is very hard about homeschooling is just being patient with your kids but that's just hard being a parent you know being a parent is being patient with your kids so to me homeschooling is just like being a good parent because a good parent should be teaching their children should be being patient with them should be teaching them life skills you shouldn't just either be lazy or think you're not capable of doing it because God has given you the capability to be able to raise your children and that's all homeschooling is, it's just raising your children. Uh, so homeschooling is one of those. You know, standards for your children, how you discipline them, you know, we should discipline them with the rod, but how frequently, what you discipline them for, these are all convictions. And also what you allow your children to watch. Some people don't allow their children to watch certain things or play certain things, play with certain toys. Use of technology, time on technology is one of those things. So these are different convictions that people have. And we need to be aware of that, right? How technology can affect our lives. I know that's, that's something dangerous today, that technology consumes our lives. And sometimes people are just so active on their phones and so active on social media and whatnot that they're neglecting their children. And I think we all have a danger of that because we all have smartphones now. So make sure you, you, you spend time with your children, you're paying attention to them and you're not just always with them, you're on your phone just ignoring them. Right? Because before you know it, you know, you're gonna set some bad habits for them and also before you know it, they're gonna be grown up and you're gonna like miss all that time with them because you were so worried about that Facebook group. You were so worried about what was happening in somebody else's life that you missed what was happening right before your very own eyes. So, in conclusion, I know this is a bit of a long sermon, but hopefully it was interesting for you. In conclusion, you may have a bit of... When people learn about commandments and convictions, and they realise a lot of things that they've learned in Christianity are not actually commandments, that they're convictions, there's a bit of uneasiness, because it's like, man, like, what do I do now? Because I don't know, I don't know what's right or wrong anymore, like, I don't know, so that's why I'm giving you some principles to determine what's right and wrong. Because some people are uneasy. It's like, I just want somebody to tell me, just tell me what to wear. Tell me how often I have to be at church. Tell me how much Bible I have to read every day. Tell me how many times I have to spank my children a day. You know, just tell me. You know, but this is not how it works. Right? There are areas of conviction in the Bible that, that you have to use these principles that God's Word to guide you to make the best choice. So maybe you can take some consolation in some certainty that not everything is certain. You know, that I am certain of, that not everything is certain. Um, and just because something is a conviction, I'm not downplaying its importance. So when it comes to, like, you know, drugs, we talk about clothing, how to raise your kids, just because these are areas of conviction, that doesn't mean they're not important. They're very important. I'm just saying that they are not specified and outlined for you as commandments. You need some wisdom to determine what is best by God, what is best by your children, what is best by other people, and is what is best for you as well. So we can't change the commandments. Just remember, we can't change the commandments, but we can change people's convictions. So that's why sometimes when I'm preaching up here and I have a conviction, you know, I'm trying to convince you, hey, this is why you ought to have this conviction. This is what's wise to do. And if you take on those same convictions, then you will change according to those convictions too. But you need to understand the difference because if you don't, you can fall into those three dangers, remember? One is that your convictions may override a commandment, which is not good, right? Another one is that you may condemn somebody 
for something that you shouldn't condemn them for. And the last one is, is you may have your emphasis in the wrong areas. Sometimes people are so focused on convictions that they forget the weightier matters of the law. They condemn people for their convictions and they forget that love, loving your brother, is so much more important than our personal convictions. All right, let's pray. Thank you, Lord, for your word. Um, I just pray, Lord, uh, I know this was a lengthy, meaty sermon, Lord, but I just pray uh, it was very practical, help people think about how to judge these things. Lord, help us not to have the mindset of like, we just don't care about what we do. We don't care about others. Because Lord, our, our actions should be guided by love, love for you, love for the brethren, love to do what's right. So help us, Lord, to have that mindset and help that mindset, Lord, raise our standards, not because we just take the doctrines of men as commandments, but Lord, because we are trying to seek a higher standard of living, a, a more strict uh, convictions. And Lord, may that show in our desire to want to serve you as closely to your word as possible. We pray uh, in Jesus' name. Amen.